right, so today we're going to go into part 14. And it is possibly going to be the last part. I don't know. We'll have to see how fast we can get through this. It's, it's definitely going to be close. Otherwise, we'll have to do just one more part next week. So this is going to be part 14 of the search for the doctrine of grace. Now, I know that it's been a long journey. I know there's been a lot of really cool things that we've covered. It's also somewhat getting boring. And I understand that, too, because we're seeing a theme that's consistent. It's, you know, okay, we get it. We get it. But you know what? We need to cover every verse because we said we would and for integrity and so that nobody could argue that we left any verses out. In the meantime, I will always try to find a little nugget here and a little nugget there to make it worth listening through the teachings. But the good news is that we are seeing a consistency and it's not that it's so much boring. It's like the light bulbs up and you go, I get it now. That's the cool part. It's no longer brand new. It's no longer like, wow. It's like, oh, it's obvious. I get it. I see it. That's the good stuff. That's the good stuff, that now it all makes sense. So let's go ahead and plow through, the, uh, through Timothy here, and let's see if we can get down all the way through Hebrews, and we just might get finished. 1 Timothy chapter 1, we have the word for grace appearing two times in verse 2 and in verse 14. And by the way, as we go through this, I want us to keep in mind an interesting question that came up on Facebook. When we're defining things, because somebody asked me the question, uh, no, I actually asked somebody who ever posted my teaching the question. He said, is this guy going to ever get, you know, give the real true definition of grace and blah, blah, blah. And he put his definition. And of course, it was according to Strong's. And my question is this. Are we using Strong's or the scriptures to define the words? Because Strong is only doing what all of us always have done also. is just parroting what everybody's always believed. We always believed that grace was unmerited favor. Turns out we were wrong. And so Strong's is not the end-all, be-all. Strong's is a very useful tool because it's a comprehensive dictionary of all Hebrew and Greek terms, and he's done a fairly good job most of the time. But Strong is also coming through the filters of his own background as a Christian. And so what we have to do is we have to remember that we're looking for scriptural usage to really define a word more than something like Strong's. Also because there are words today that actually mean almost the opposite of what they meant when they first were being used, say, two or three hundred years ago. Usage changes how we understand words to mean. And so we have to understand that that happens also. So even though today, if you say grace, most people think you're saying unmerited favor, that doesn't mean that that's what it always meant if you go back to scriptural usage. So let's be careful with that as we do things, because it's not just grace, it's all terminology. When you go to Strong's, just be careful, Strong's is not the end-all source on what words are defined as. Just keep that in the back of your head. Okay, 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 1, Shaul, an emissary of Yeshua Messiah, according to a command of Elohim our Savior, and of the Master Yeshua Messiah, our expectation. To Timothy, a genuine child in the belief, favor, compassion, peace from Elohim our Father and Yeshua Messiah, our master. So there you have your typical Paul greeting, which had favor in it. And of course, that word for favor, we understand, is that he's wishing him to be approved of or in good standing in the eyes of the Almighty. Very important there. Also, interesting in verse 1 that Paul says, according to a command of Elohim, our Savior, and of the master Yeshua Messiah. This is consistent with Isaiah, where you know, Yahweh says, I am your Savior, besides me, there's no Savior. Because Shaul is recognizing that the saving comes from the Father through the Son. And so there's a combination going on here. So he says, look, according to a command of Elohim, our Savior, and of the Master, Yeshua Messiah, our expectation. Yeshua Messiah is our expectation. He's also our Savior. And so there's an interesting play going on there that we're going to get into more deeply in a future teaching. But there's an interesting little verse to chew on to see, well, why would he say it that way? You probably never even noticed that, never just missed that. But that's something that's there that we should be chewing on and saying, why would he say according to a command of Elohim, our Savior, and of the Master Yeshua, Messiah, our expectation? And by the way, our expectation, meaning we are expected to be like him, and we're expecting him to come and do certain things. There's a lot of expectation going on there. Verse 3. As I appealed to you when I went into Macedonia to, re to remain in Ephesus in order to command some not to teach differently, nor pay attention to fables and endless genealogies, which cause disputes rather than an administration of Elohim, which is in belief. Do we not see all of this going on today? People arguing over fables and endless genealogies and all that. It's not just genealogies. What they're arguing over is calendars and other. We have our own things today that we argue over that are no 
you know, no less or no more significant or insignificant than what was ever going on in this particular verse. But the point is, he goes, look, these are caused disputes rather than an administration of Elohim which is in belief. So what is he saying here? I think what he's saying is like, look, let them be right in their own minds in the best effort they have, and you be right in your own mind in the best effort you have, and let Abba sort it out. It's not about you convincing them or them convincing you. All that do, does is generate disputes, which we uh, will see in, in Titus. Actually, I don't know if we're going to get to that verse, but in Titus 3, he says, look, these things are unprofitable and useless, and so don't be doing it. If we're all walking out Deuteronomy 8.12, which is to show that it's in our hearts to keep the commandments or not, to be humbled actually first, and be humble enough to try and do this the best you can with all your effort, with all your might, with all your strength, with all your belief, Amen. then you have to recognize and, and, and respect that your brother's doing the same thing, even if your brother doesn't come to the same conclusions you do. You are not in a position, or I should say in a much more straightforward, who are you to judge? Who are you to judge them whether or not they're doing it right and you think you're doing it right? You've been wrong before, you'll be wrong again. Try to be eating a whole lot less hat. <laughs> you know, as far as eating your hat or a lot less crow when you find out you were wrong after you made such a big stink. Have you ever been wrong after making a big, a big show about it, a big to-do about it? Did that feel good? No, it feels awful. Okay, so that's what he's saying. He says, look, there's no point in all that. Verse 5. Now the goal of this command is love from a clean heart, from a good conscience, and a sincere belief, which some, having missed the goal, turned aside to senseless talk, wishing to be teachers of Torah, understanding neither what they say nor concerning what they strongly affirm. Boy, do we have enough of those guys running around all over the internet. Guys who want to be teachers, who understand nothing, they don't understand what they're saying, they don't, they're not doing what they're saying, they don't have any idea what they're doing. He says, and we... Know that the Torah is good if one uses it legitimately. Of course, we have a very hard time deciding who knows what the legitimate use of Torah is. That's why you have to get out of the judgment seat and do the best you can and leave everybody else alone. Because on some of it, you're going to be right, and some of it, they're going to be right. So don't fight about it. Where's the love in all of that is what he's saying here. You know, you have to have a clean heart, a good conscience, and sincere belief, and it's got to be all wrapped around by love. He says, um, verse 9, knowing this, that the Torah is not laid down for a righteous being, but for the lawless and unruly, for the wicked and for sinners and for the wrongdoers and profane, for those who kill their fathers or mothers for murderers, for those who whore, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers and for whatever else that is contrary to the sound teaching, according to the esteemed good news of the blessed Elohim, which was entrusted to me. All right, so we're hearing here very clearly as he's going through all of this that the Torah is what shows you what's right and what's wrong. If, you're, if, you're, if you know and are doing what's right, you don't have a need for the Torah because you have it already known. You understand it. You don't need to constantly reread not to murder if you already know not to murder. But it may be an important reminder for somebody that comes from a murdering culture and a murdering background. Or stealing. I mean, I've heard and read about people in, who've gone on missionary trips to cultures where stealing was like breathing. That just was their culture. People just stole everything all the time. They probably would need the commandment that tells them not to steal. And they would probably need it to be, reminded to, uh, you know, be a reminder for them all the time. Until they are set free from that false lifestyle, that false understanding. Verse 12, he says, And I thank Messiah Yeshua, our Master, who empowered me, because he counted me trustworthy, putting me into service, me, although I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and an insulter, but compassion was shown me because being ignorant, I did it in unbelief. Look what he says here. But compassion was shown me. Why didn't he say grace? Why isn't grace in that verse? Isn't that what we would assume grace would be? But grace was shown me. I mean, after all, I was a blasphemer and a persecutor and an insulter, but he showed me grace? No, he didn't show him grace. He showed him grace. Mercy, compassion, which has been syncretized into our understanding of grace. And that's why we have a problem, because grace and mercy and compassion have all been merged into one idea when they're separate. He says, you know, compassion was shown me being, uh, uh, because being ignorant, I did it in unbelief. 
He says, and the favor, now we're going to hear about the grace, and the grace of our master was exceedingly increased with belief and love, which are in Messiah Yeshua. He says, so after he had compassion on me and showed me this mercy, I started walking in belief instead of unbelief. Notice the change in words. At the end of verse 13, he was walking in unbelief. Now he's doing it in belief, and that brought him approval, put him in good standing with the master Messiah Yeshua. Very simple and very straightforward. Let's continue in chapter 6. Chapter 6, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some by longing for it have strayed from belief and pierced themselves through with many pains. But you, O man of Elohim, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, reverence, belief, love, endurance, meekness. These are all fruit of the Spirit. Fight the good fight of the belief, lay hold of ever, on everlasting life, to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession before many witnesses. Now we're heading eventually to verse 21, but notice this. He says, to lay a hold of everlasting life to which you were also called. So you're called to everlasting life, but it's something you have to lay a hold of. You got to grab a hold of. It's not something that you just automatically have. Here's Shaul telling you, lay a hold on everlasting life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession before many witnesses. So how do you do that? It's all through belief. It's through the pursuit of righteousness. Verse 11, reverence, belief, love, endurance, meekness, all that good stuff is how you lay a hold on everlasting life. By the way, the pursuit of righteousness, and we're going to do a teaching called the pursuit of righteousness, is all about Torah observance, doing what is right, pursuing right behavior. Verse 13, in the sight of Elohim who gives life to all and of Messiah Yeshua who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate, I charge you that you guard the command spotlessly, blamelessly until the appearing of our master Yeshua. Now, is this before or after Yeshua has died? After. Okay, so now we're waiting for this second coming, aren't we? That's what he's referring to, the appearance of Yeshua. So at least until then, we know we're supposed to be keeping the commandments. Shaul is telling us, he says, look, you are to guard the commands spotlessly, blamelessly, until the appearing of our Master Yeshua Messiah. So he hasn't appeared. We need to be keeping all this stuff. Which in his own seasons he shall reveal, and the blessed and only ruler, the sovereign of sovereigns and the master of masters, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or is able to see, to whom be respect and everlasting might. Amen. Charge those who are rich in this present age not to be high-minded, nor to trust in uncertainty of riches, but in the living Elohim who gives us richly all for enjoyment, to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous, ready to share. Now let's stop there for a second. First of all, this is an admonition to all you ministries out there, and I hope you're listening. Stop begging for money. Stop asking everybody for donations. Stop begging for money. I never do this. And that's not to pat myself on the back like I'm wonderful. I'm just trying to set an example. Shaul is saying, look, he says, charge those who are rich in the present age not to be high-minded, nor to trust in the uncertainty of riches, but in the living Elohim. If you're begging for money, if you're seeking after money, are you really trusting in the living Elohim? If you have a ministry... The living Elohim can inspire any one of those people at any moment to give you anything. Including selling everything they have and give that to you. If that's what Abba puts in their head and puts in their heart, you need not ask. You need not ask. It's for Abba to inspire. But see, when you're trusting in the riches, then, it, then what happens is when it's not coming in, then you panic. Then you're being led by fear and doubt. How many of you have seen ministries that are always in a panic mode? And you get the emails of the begging for money because they're in a panic. Oh, without your help, none of this would be possible. Nonsense. Without your help, all of it could still be possible because I will find somebody else to inspire to give the money. Amen. No ministry needs you. Ooh, don't be offended. You have a blessed opportunity to be used in the service of that ministry. But no ministry needs you. We all need him. The ministry needs him, and you need him. The ministry needs you through his, I mean, the ministry needs him, him to inspire you to serve, to serve within that ministry as well as to support that ministry. The ministry needs you to be a flow-through point to bless others. 
Okay? And the Father needs you to be that flow-through point. Okay? There is no need for you. He could choose up rocks to do it if he wants, he said. He doesn't need you. You have a blessed opportunity that you may be squandering to be a part of things. But you need to take it seriously and understand the opportunity you have. Do you appreciate the blessing of the opportunity, not that you walk around saying, well, this ministry needs me, and if they don't understand it, I just won't give them any more money. Well, he does, the ministry doesn't need you. The ministry needs to be doing what Yahweh wants, and if Yahweh likes what the ministry is doing, Yahweh will inspire somebody to support it. If the ministry is not doing what Yahweh likes, then the ministry will not be supported, and then they'll end up begging. So instead of asking the right question, which is, why don't I have any money? And then find out what they're doing wrong or what they're not doing that they should be doing. Even if they're not doing something wrong, there may be something they're supposed to be doing they're not doing. Instead, they beg for money. Instead of asking, Abba, why is it that you're not giving me money? There's, you must be trying to get my attention. Well, maybe it's because you always beg that you're not trusting him. How about stop begging and just trust him? Maybe it's as simple as that. We have never asked for funds. And we've never needed any. They've always been supplied. And we're very, very thankful that Abba's used you guys to do that. And we praise you. And when during the services, we do a blessing over the tithes and offerings because of that. But let's understand what he's talking about here. We have a problem. By the way, the problem is not with you guys. It's with the ministries. The ministries are not trusting. They're trusting in the money. They're trusting. By the way, some of you have that problem, though, when you're worried about losing your jobs because of Sabbath keeping. Now you're trusting in the money. You're not trusting in the Almighty. You've got to trust in the Almighty to give you the money through a better job or to bless you with favor, with approval in his eyes. And if you've done, you say, Abba, if I've done anything right in your eyes, if I've done anything to be approved of, please show me favor in this situation. That's the pattern you see all throughout the Tanakh. Use that pattern. Everybody used it. If I've done anything to be approved of in your sight, please do this for me. But you ought to be sure that you know that you've actually done some things that are approved in his sight. You also ought to be aware of the things you've done that are not approved of in his sight. And there's kind of a balance sheet there. If you've been doing just as much that he doesn't approve of as, as he approves of, you're kind of at a net zero. That's not going to get you a whole lot of approval. And so you've got to ask him, Father, what do I need to do to do more to be approved than to be disapproved? Show me the areas that I'm not approved so I could be approved. Does it make sense? And this is what we're talking about here. And again, I hope I didn't offend anybody by saying you're not, that Abba doesn't need you. He wants you. He'd love for you to be the one. That's why he called you, because he knows you have the heart for it. He would love for it to be you, but just don't think for a second that it has to be you, because if it's not, then somehow the system's going to fail and fall on its nose because you didn't do it. He'll just find somebody else to do it. And you better pray he doesn't decide to just go somewhere else and leave you alone and just say, okay, wipe my hands of you. I'm going to go find somebody else who wants to do this stuff. Amen. See, that's what it's really about. And do you want to be the one that hears the call and heeds the call and takes action upon being called to do these things? Amen. And that's what it's really about. Continuing here, he says, no, notice he's not only talking about money. He says, look, he says, to do good, to be rich in good works. We're in verse 18. He says, charge those who are rich in verse 17 in this present age not to be high-minded nor to trust in uncertainty. In other words, people that are rich in this world think, I must be doing something wonderful because look at all the money I have. Well, that's not the right measure of your success in the eyes of the Almighty. He says, don't be trusting in that. That's what you call uncertainty of riches. He says, but trust in the living Elohim who gives us richly all for enjoyment. To do good. See, the reason he gives it to you is to do what? He gives us richly all for enjoyment so that we do good with it. He's not going to give you the money just so that you can have five big screen TVs and four cars and whatever else you want. He's going to give you the money so that you can do good with it. To be rich in good works. To be generous, ready to share, storing up for themselves a good for foundation from, for the time to come so that they lay hold on everlasting life. So now he seems to be connecting everlasting life to what? To doing good, to being rich in good works, to being generous, to being ready to share. Hmm. Doesn't that sound like probably the type of person he wants to live with forever? Do you think Yahweh wants to live with people forever that are about selfish gain or generous sharing and providing of good works? I think he wants to spend forever with those who are about giving, sharing, blessing, guarding after his commands, loving, 
What did he say earlier in the verses? He was talking about righteousness being pursued, reverence, belief, love, endurance, meekness. These are all things we should be pursuing. I don't see a lot of that necessarily in the people that pursue riches, the wealth of this world, the riches of this world. Verse 20 says, Oh, Timothy, watch over that which has been entrusted to you, turning aside from the profane and empty babblings and contradictions of the falsely called knowledge. There's a lot of that going on on that internet today. A lot of quote-unquote things claiming to be knowledge, and everybody's chasing after knowledge. The body is so Gnostic, it's sickening. We are absolutely wallowing in our Gnosticism. We are pursuing knowledge for knowledge's sake. We have a love of knowledge, and all we want to do is just gorge ourselves on knowledge. What about doing with what you already know? How about doing what you know and working those works in integrity and in fullness of your effort and fullness of your heart and fullness of your strength. Oh no, I, I don't want to do the things I know. I want to get more knowledge. So we're getting, you know what it's like? It's like when people used to ask the question, is knowledge power? Or they would say, knowledge is power. Well, no, just knowledge is not power. Because if, if information or knowledge was power, then a library would be the most powerful place in the world. You got more books of knowledge in a library than almost anywhere, right? But it's not knowledge that's powered. Knowledge that's not applied is simply information. And so what people are doing is they're pursuing knowledge and all they're doing is getting tons of information unless they're actually applying it. And they're not. And you know they're not. And you know you're not. And I know I'm not. We're not applying what we need to know, not as fully as we should. And you know that, and I know that, all about ourselves. We all look in the mirror and realize that we fall short. Of course, that sometimes, though, we do walk away from it, forgetting what we looked at. We look in the mirror of the Word. So now going back, he says, Oh, Timothy, watch over that which has been entrusted to you. Guess what? This stuff has been entrusted to you, just like Timothy. Turning aside from profane, the empty babblings and contradictions of the falsely called knowledge. By the way, in those knowledges that are out there that people keep coming to me with, tons of contradictions. Oh, my goodness. Tons of contradictions. He says, which some, having professed it, have missed the goal concerning the belief, which is what? He says, approval be with you. Amen. He says, having professed it, having missed the goal concerning the belief. What is the goal? The goal is approval. Not approval by men. And that's what happens is people say, oh, well, you don't fit into our group because you don't get approval by our group. Well, who cares about what group you're approved by? You want approval by the Almighty. That's the approval you're seeking. Amen? Amen. Let's go now to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, and I think we're going to be caught up in having to do this in another part. Let's see what we can get done. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 1. Shaul, an emissary of Yeshua Messiah, by the desire of Elohim, according to the promise of life, which is in Messiah Yeshua, to Timothy, my beloved son, favor, compassion, peace from Elohim, the Father, and Messiah Yeshua, our master. Okay, the typical Pauline greeting, but there's some new little different elements in here. He said here, according to the promise of life, which is in Messiah Yeshua. The promise of life is in Messiah Yeshua. We have to go back to our definition of what life is and what Messiah Yeshua is. Okay, John 14, Yeshua says, I am the truth, the way, and the life. So he says he's the life. He, or we, we take the words that out of there, I am truth, I am way, I am life. So Yeshua is life, so we understand that part. But also, the life is in the truth, the life is in the word, the life is in the Torah. When the person came up to Yeshua and said, Master, Rabbi, how may I have a, eternal life? He said, keep the commandments, keep the Torah, do the, do the laws. And so he says here, look, according to the promise of life, which is in Yeshua, which is in the truth, which is in the word, which is in the Torah. You need your fullness of your definition there. Continuing, verse 3 says, I thank Elohim. And by the way, we're looking for favor in verse 2. We already read it in verse 9. So in verse 3, I thank Elohim whom I serve with a clear conscience, as my forefathers did, as I unceasingly remember you in my prayers night and day, longing to see you as I remember your tears, so that I might be filled with joy. For I recollect the sincere belief which is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Unique, and I am persuaded is in you too. For this reason, I remind you to stir up the gift of Elohim which is in you through the laying on of, of my hands. 
For Elohim has not given us a spirit of cowardice, but of power and of love and of self-control. Now let's break this down a little bit. First of all, he says, he says, I recollect the sincere belief which is in you. When you see phrases like that, it's referring to he remembers the actions taken by the beliefs. In other words, he saw Timothy doing certain things and not doing certain things because of his sincere, sincerity of belief. Your beliefs, when they're put into three dimensions, are called works, actions, the things that you do. So I'm sure that Paul is saying, yeah, look, I recollect that all the things that I saw you doing through your belief. He says, and I, I understand that. And, I, I know, and by the way, I saw this belief also in your grandmother and in your mother. He said, for this reason, I remind you to stir up the gift of Elohim, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. He says, that is the, the gift of the Ruach, the Holy Spirit. For Elohim has not given us a spirit of cowardice, but of power and of love and of self-control or a sound mind. So now here, you're seeing an explanation of the fruit of one spirit or the other. So if you have cowardice, do you really have the Ruach HaKodesh? No. I mean, that's what Shaul is saying here. He says, look, stir up the gift because that gift that's in you, that spirit that's given you is not a spirit of cowardice. What is cowardice? Well, it's simply fear. And then when you have fear as a behavioral trait that you embrace on a regular basis, you become what's called a coward. A coward is simply someone who's afraid all the time. So you may be afraid occasionally, but if you're afraid all the time, you become a coward. And so we have a real big problem in the body. The body is wrought with fear. The body's afraid of doing things right, afraid of doing things wrong, afraid of this calendar or that calendar, afraid of this Torah observance or that Torah observance, afraid. We're afraid of everything. And we're walking in fear. And that's the thing we have to stop doing. We don't want to be walking in a spirit of cowardice. He said he gave you a spirit of power, love, and of self-control or a sound mind. And so that means that we should have the discipline over our minds and our hearts, our emotions, so that we have confidence and strength and power and not cowardice. And yet we are walking in this fear all the time. And that is evident a lot when the world wants to, you know, sort of chime in. This is a time of year when that happens a lot. Mom's going to call you or your cousin or your brother or your best friend and want you to come over and do something Christmassy. Or they're going to want you to do something related in that way, and you have to decide, am I going to be afraid of their reaction, or am I just going to very, as meekly and gently as I can explain to them, I can't come and participate in that. There should be a strength, but a strength that's in a quiet, meek way, in a loving, gentle, kind way, where you can say, I'm sorry, but I can't do that. I won't be coming to that. Or you're afraid of their reaction. Because you know what? You know them. Some of them are going to blast you to, you know what? They're going to, as we used to say, blast you to kingdom come, right? They're going to blast you as hard as they can with both barrels. And you have to know that it's coming and not be afraid of it. And be able to say calmly, I know you feel that way. I'm sorry you feel that way. Please, I respect where you are. You need to respect where I am. And where I am, I can't do that. I love you, but you need to respect that. This is a spirit of power and of love that you need to have that comes through the Ruach HaKodesh. Verse 8. So not be ashamed of the witness of our master, nor of me, his prisoner, but suffer hardship with me for the good news according to the power of Elohim. Did you hear what he just said? Suffer with him. We're going to have to suffer. And we've read lots of verses like that in the past where Yeshua said things like about taking up your cross and following him, your stake and following him. You're going to have to suffer as he suffered. It's not, it's not this uh, glory to glory nonsense you get in the churches where, hey, you come and make an altar call and your life's going to be perfect from then on. No more pain, no more suffering, everything's wonderful. I don't see that anywhere in Scripture. It says, rather, it says the other way. It says, he came and you're going to suffer as he suffered so that you can be found in approval to receive the crown in the end. It says, to he who endures to the end... To he who overcomes to the end, we have the teaching, endure and receive the crown of life, and to he who overcomes, to that one who endures and overcomes to the end. Well, if there's no suffering, what's it to overcome? You have to overcome all of that stuff to the end, and that one receives all the good stuff. Go read Revelation. It's all there. All the stuff you want is predicated on to the one who overcomes shall receive all this. As a matter of fact, that's in Revelation, I believe in Revelation 21 at the very end there. 
Let me just make sure. Let's see. Um, yep. In Revelation 21, he just described the new heavens and the new earth and all the wonderful stuff and wiping away every tear. No more pain. No more death. No more mourning. No more crying. All of this good stuff. Everything is made new again. And then we get to verse 7. It says, The one who overcomes shall inherit all of this. And I shall be his Elohim, and he shall be my son. So you've got to overcome. What do you have to overcome? All the adversity and all the opportunities where you could have been in fear and doubt instead of trust and belief. Everything in this book, and I say this all the time, and I'm sorry if you're bored of it. I hope you're not. Everything in this book is about trust and belief up, in, up at odds against fear and doubt. And you've got to choose one of those two paths. I'm either going to walk in fear and doubt, or I'm going to walk in trust and belief. Those two do not go together. It's either one or the other. You're either in trust and belief or you're in fear and doubt. Let's continue. We're in verse uh, 9. He who has saved us has called us with a set of our calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and favor, which was given to us in Messiah Yeshua before times of old. But now revealed by the appearing of our Savior Yeshua Messiah, who indeed abolished death and brought life, abolished death and brought life and incorruptibility to life through the good news. Now, in verse 9, here's one of those verses again. He said, he called us with a set apart calling. Let's remember that part first. He called us, he saved us, and called us with a set apart calling. What is a set apart calling? It means you were called to be set apart from the world, and set apart is the word kadosh in the Hebrew, and it means to be set apart for the singular purpose of serving the Almighty and His purposes. So you were called to be set apart to serve the Almighty and His purposes, not according to your works, in other words, the way you wanted to do it, or what you would rather do, or how you would have things be, but according to His own purpose, and the approval which was given to us in Messiah Yeshua by doing things according to His purpose. So it's not here, in my opinion, talking about it's not about works. It's nothing to do with works. He says it's not according to your works. We got a lot of people out there that think they're getting into the kingdom because they're doing it the way they want to do it and that's going to be just fine. Oh, God's going to be just fine with the way I'm doing it. He knows my heart and he knows I'm, I'm, I'm doing it. The, you know. Yeah, he knows your heart. Your heart is to do what you want to do. And you're doing it according to your purposes. Follow the verse. Who has saved us and called us with a set-apart calling to be set apart according to the commandments, according to his desire, not according to our works, in other words, you're called not to do it your way, but to do it his way. Am I reading this okay? Is that, a, is that a good interpretation? Or am I spinning it? But according to his own purpose and favor, which was given to us in Messiah Yeshua, in the Torah, in the truth, in life, before times of old. By the way, look what it says. Which was given to us in Messiah Yeshua before times of old. Oh, but we're special because we were born after Yeshua came and died and was resurrected. Well, I don't think that's what Paul is talking about here. Shaul is not talking about that time of old. He's talking about times of old. So this favor, this purpose, all is according to his purpose and favor which was given to us in the truth, in the Torah, and Messiah Yeshua, from times of old. So now we're looking back to the Yahweh of the Old Testament, the one who was on the mountain, the, the, the lawgiver. The creator who interacted with man. We've talked about this before. Now we're back to the commandments given on Sinai and the instructions given throughout the books from Genesis through Deuteronomy. And then again reiterated by the prophets and in the writings. He says, Messiah Yeshua that was given to us before times of old. Also, he says that he knew you. He knew that you would do these things. He knew before you did them that you were going to be worthy or not worthy or qualify or not qualify. He also said that Messiah Yeshua was slain before the foundations of the earth. So these things are all known about before things ever went forward. Such an interesting little verse here. It said, look, but now revealed, as we go into verse 10, it says, but now revealed by the appearing of our Savior Yeshua Messiah. So this stuff was given to us way before in times of old, but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Yeshua Messiah, who indeed abolished death and brought life and incorruptibility to light. Through the good news... So he brought it to light through the good news. What's the good news? The good news is Torah is relevant and for everybody and it works. The good news is that the lost scattered tribes can start to return. 
The good news is that forgiveness of sin is now possible to be, re to be restored fully so that you can be in the kingdom. There's a lot, of bit, a lot of parts to this good news thing. He says, for which I am appointed a proclaimer and an emissary and a teacher of the nations, of the Gentiles. For this reason I also suffer these matters, but I am not ashamed, but I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to watch over that which I have, uh, I have entrusted to him until that day. Can we all say that? Can we all say that we also suffer matters but are not ashamed because we know and believe and are persuaded that he's able to watch over that which you have entrusted with to him and was entrusted to him until that day? Now, by the way, look what he says. He says he's able to watch over that which I have entrusted to him. Have you entrusted things to him? Have you entrusted your life, your future, and everything that, that you are hoping for? Have you entrusted it to him? Have you said, Abba, I'm just, going to be, I'm just going to sell out completely and trust you. I'm going to do it your way and just trust and believe that that's the way that's going to work. But you have to be a completely sold out person. You've got to sell out to it completely. You cannot be holding back. You can't be like Lot's wife turning around. You can't be like Yeshua said, the one who's pushing the plow, but, you know, but looking backwards, you know, it's, it's worthy. Of the, it says anybody who set his hand to the plow and looks backward is not worthy. Not worthy of the kingdom. You don't want to be that person. So again, we're talking about in verse 9, the word favor was there. The favor is his approval, it says, but according to his own purpose and approval, which was given to us in Messiah Yeshua. In Messiah Yeshua. Messiah Yeshua is the path to approval. The fullness that Yeshua is, is the path to approval. Becoming more like him, being transformed into his image, obeying his commands. All of this stuff, the truth, the life, the, the Torah, the word, this is all what leads to that purpose. So you want approval, it's through Yeshua, through the fullness of Yeshua. The churches are embracing a false personification of Yeshua with none of that other stuff. It's just a God being that they believe died and was resurrected and somehow now they're all saved. They have like no depth of understanding of what the fullness of Yeshua is. And that's why they suffer and that's why they're confused. Let's continue now in chapter 2 and in verse 1. You then, my son, be strong in the favor that is in Messiah Yeshua. Be strong in the approval that is in Messiah Yeshua. Think about this verse the other way. You then, my son, be strong in the undeserved, unmerited favor that is in Messiah Yeshua. Did Messiah Yeshua have unmerited favor? He's filled with the abundant favor and approval of his Father. If there's one being that ever existed on this planet or in the universe that has the approval of the Father, that's the one. That is the one right there. So unmerited favor makes no sense at all in that verse. You then, my son, being strong in grace, that is in Messiah Yeshua. See, you put the word grace in there, and now we're in Christianese again. Because Christianese is a word that we really don't have any idea what it means. It has meaning, but we've lost that meaning. So if you put grace in there, now it says, okay, be strong in the grace that is in Messiah Yeshua. Well, that sounds like a wonderful thing. But we don't even know what grace means. He says, you then, my son, be strong in the approval that is in Messiah Yeshua, the good standing that is in Messiah Yeshua. In other words, be filled with, what, with the fullness of what Messiah Yeshua is, and you will be found in good favor and approval. And what you have heard from me among many witnesses, entrust these to trustworthy men who shall be competent to teach others as well. Ah, there's a problem going on in the Internet. We've got all kinds of people teaching and doing whatever. We have no idea if they've been entrusted if they've been trusted because they're trustworthy, do we know if they're trustworthy men? We don't know anything about these people. They're faceless people on the internet. We don't know if they're trustworthy men, and we don't know if they're competent to teach others as well. But he says to Timothy, he says, look, you go and, go and share this stuff and entrust these things to trustworthy men, and men who shall be competent to teach others as well. He says, suffer hardship with us as good soldiers of Yeshua Messiah. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in the affairs of this life in order to please only him who enlisted him as a soldier. And if anyone complete, uh, excuse me, competes in a game, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Is that, do you guys all know that verse was always in your Bible there? Paul thinks there's rules. Where do you think those rules are coming from? What rules could he possibly be talking about? He says, if anyone competes in a game, he is not crowned Oh, now he's talking about a crown. So you're the winner who wins the race, you run the race to win the race, and at the end of the race is a crown. He says, don't let anybody steal your crown. 
but you're not going to be crowned unless you compete according to the rules. Interesting. The hardworking farmer ought to be first to receive his share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the master shall give you understanding into all of this. See, he also understood that it doesn't matter what he says. What matters is that the ruach, or the master through the ruach, is going to give you the understanding. I say the same thing. I'm not so worried about what I'm saying here and how you're hearing it. I want you to be worried about how the Ruach is helping you to understand what it is I'm reading you and what I'm saying. He says, think over what I say, for the Master shall give you understanding into all this. For remember that Yeshua Messiah of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my good news, for which I suffer hardship as a criminal unto chains, but the word of Elohim is not chained. So I endure through it all for the sake of the chosen, so that they too obtain deliverance, which is in Messiah Yeshua, with... with um, with everlasting esteem. How far did I want to go here? I only wanted to go to verse 5, but I kept going. Anyway, but understand, this is all talking about all these things are connected to the idea of what it takes to receive favor. As a matter of fact, continuing, he goes, trustworthy is the word, for if, if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are not trustworthy, he remains trustworthy. It is impossible for him to deny himself. In other words, you're not being trustworthy doesn't taint him, it only taints you. Anyway, let's understand what we are doing here and how it all plays out. This is how we receive favor. Let's continue in, let's see, 2 Timothy chapter 4. And this is going to be quick because it's just the closing of the book, of the letter. And he closes with what he closes with often. He closes with, the Master Yeshua Messiah, be with you, be with your spirit, favor be with you. This is the way Paul closes almost all of his letters, or if not all of them. He's saying, look, approval be with you. He's praying, and his, his last thing is to, to wish favor or approval upon them. Let's go now to Titus. Titus chapter 1, and see if we can get through this pretty quickly. And we're going to read, starting in verse 1. Saul, a servant of Elohim and an emissary of Yeshua Messiah, according to the belief of Elohim's chosen ones, and knowledge of the truth, according to reverence, and expectation of everlasting life, which Elohim, who does not lie, promised before times of old, but in its own times has manifested his word through preaching with which I was entrusted according to the command of Elohim, our Savior, now, he said a whole lot of things different this time, but notice he hasn't mentioned Messiah yet. He doesn't mention him until verse 4, but he's already mentioned him three times or so. He said in verse 1, he says, Chosen ones and knowledge of the truth, to the belief of Elohim's chosen ones and knowledge of the truth of Yeshua of the Torah, according to reverence, and expectation of everlasting life. Well, what's that? Yeshua, the Torah, the truth, which Elohim, who does not lie, promised from times of old. And then we get to verse 4, finally goes to Titus, a genuine child according to our common belief. Approval, compassion, peace from Elohim, the Father and the Master Yeshua, Messiah, our Savior. So again, it, it makes no sense to stick unmerited favor in there at all. Now, he already says compassion in there. Compassion is unmerited. So he's wishing approval and mercy on the person because he knows that there's going to be often times when you're going to do things that are not in approval. And so you're going to need mercy or compassion at those times. Let's continue now in verse, uh, chapter 2 and verse 1. But you speak what is fitting for sound teaching. The older men are to be sober, serious, sensible, sound in belief, in love, in endurance. The older women likewise are to be set apart in behavior, not slanderers, not given much wine, teachers of what is good, in order for them to train the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, blameless, workers at home, good, subject to their own husbands, in order that the word of Elohim is not evil spoken of. Likewise, urge the young men to be sensible. Show yourselves to them an example of good works in all matters, in teaching, uh, un uncorruptness, seriousness, soundness of speech beyond reproach, in order that the uh, opponent is, not, uh, is put to shame, having no evil word to say about you. Sounds like a lot of works here, a lot of effort to be done here. Servants should be subject to their own masters to be well-pleasing in every way, not back-talking, not stealing, but showing all good trustworthiness so that they adorn the teaching of Elohim, our Savior, in every way. Now, all of this is to get to verse 11. For the saving gift of Elohim has appeared to all men. The word there is the same word for grace. It says, for the approval of Elohim has appeared to all men. 
The approval of Elohim has appeared to all men. Yeshua is the approval of all men. The Torah is the approval of all men. The Word is the approval of all men. The truth is, brings approval of all men. Oh, excuse me, the approval of Elohim. So the approval of Elohim, the Torah, the truth, Yeshua, has appeared to all men. So what is the approval? The approval of Elohim. Torah, truth, Yeshua, the Word, the light. All these things go together. And so we have that right there. It says, instructing us to renounce wickedness and worldly lusts and to live sensibly, righteously, reverently in the present age, looking for the blessed expectation and the esteemed appearance of the great Elohim and our Savior Yeshua Messiah, who gave himself for us to redeem us from the law. <laughs> to Why doesn't it say that there? To redeem us from the law. It says to redeem us from lawlessness and to cleanse for himself a people, his own possession, ardent for good works. Speak these matters, urge and reprove with all authority. Let no one despise you. Look, this whole good works thing is why you need to listen to well done, your good and trustworthy servant teaching, because the first part of the teaching is good. Second is trustworthy, second, third is uh, a servant. And we define good according to Scripture. And according to Scripture, there's nothing that's good unless it's of Elohim. <coughs> Even Yeshua says, why do you say good master? Why do you call me good? There's only one that's good. Even Yeshua didn't think of it as good compared to the Father. So when it says good works, they must be the works of the Father. Because that's the only way that good could be used in this, in this uh, context. It has to be the works of the Father. Speak these matters, urge and reprove with all authority, let no one despise you. Let's continue in chapter 3. We'll read verse 1. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities to obey, to be ready for every good work, not to slander anyone, not to quarrel, be quarrelsome, to be gentle, showing all meekness to all men. It's all, these are your beliefs and actions, isn't it? He says, do all of these things. He says, look, don't be quarrelsome, be gentle, show meekness to all men. This is all fruit of a spirit of obedience to the law, to the Yeshua, to the light, to the truth, to the word. Verse 3, for we ourselves were also... Once foolish, disobedient, led astray, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in evil and envy, being hated and hating one another. By the way, that is the state that you are in when you're following this disobedient, lawless sort of Christianity thing, where you get to decide for yourself what's right and what's wrong, basically, because they're not going to give you, you know, parameters. They will tell you you need to come to the Bible study and you'll need to come to the church picnic and you need to come to Sunday service and stuff. But they're not going to tell you about the good works of Torah. Back then, you're going to be doing what? You're going to be disobedient, led astray, serving various lusts and pleasures. You're going to do what you want. Yeah. Living in evil and envy and being hated and hating one another. But when kindness and the love of Elohim, our Savior, toward men appeared, He saved us not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His compassion through the washing of rebirth and the renewal of the set-apart spirit. In other words, he said, he didn't save us because we were doing righteously. He saved us because he was having compassion. Salvation is free because of mercy and compassion. If you were doing rightly, you wouldn't need saving. He said, so it wasn't because we were doing right works of righteousness, because we weren't. He said he saved us not by works of righteousness, which we, which we have done, but according to his compassion. So we, didn't, we weren't doing righteousness until after you started doing rightly after he was merciful and compassionate to you and showed you the truth. He says, through the washing of the rebirth and the renewal by the set-apart spirit, which he poured out on us richly through Yeshua Messiah, our Savior, that having been declared right by his favor, by his approval, we should be heirs according to the expectation of everlasting life. So now we then get to be declared right after we have gone through this other process in order. First, he saved us when he said, look, we ourselves were foolish. Go back to verse 3. When we were doing all this foolishness, he then saved us because he was compassionate. Follow the flow. Verse 3 goes to verse 4. Well, I mean, excuse me, verse 3 goes to verse 4 through verse 5. In our disobedience, our envies, our lusts, our evil, our, dis our doing disobedience, our, our lusting and pleasures, all this other stuff in verse 3, he said, then the kindness of, of Yeshua, of Elohim, our Savior, Yeshua, came and appeared, and then he saved us by compassion, not by righteous works, because we hadn't been doing any. We thought we were. Paul certainly thought he was. He thought everything he did was in righteousness, only to find out how wrong he was. 
He says, then, through the washing of the rebirth and renewal of the Spirit, etc., then we started walking richly through Messiah Yeshua, through the truth, through the Torah, our Savior, because it was poured out on us. And that then brings us the declaration of being right or righteous by His approval. We would then become heirs according to the expectation of the everlasting life. Did that work for you? Did that make sense? Or did I just spin the life out of it? Because some people are going to accuse me of spinning the life out of it. I think it's straightforward. It flows directly out of verse 3 into verse 5. You can't just go in verse 5, he saved us not by works of righteousness, blah, blah, blah. Well, what's the context? He just talked about what, a, what an idiot he had been in his previous life. He said, we ourselves are also foolish. We were foolish and dumb and disobedient. But then, through the forgiveness, through the mercy, through the compassion of Yeshua, we were brought and drawn into the truth where we could then be found in approval. I don't think it's that complicated a flow to follow this thing through. Let's continue. Um, ba -ba -ba -bum. Verse 7. That having been declared right by his approval, we should then become heirs according to the expectation of everlasting life. Trustworthy is the word, and in this regard I wish you to, be strongly, uh, to strongly affirm that those who have believed in Elohim should keep their minds on maintaining good works. This is good and profitable to men. Maintaining what? The good works that got you the approval in verse 5 and 6 and 7. He says, so trustworthy is the word. Do these things. Be trustworthy in it. Do the good works. This is good and profitable to men. He says, but keep away from foolish questions. This is what I was talking about earlier. I said we get to it in verse 9. Keep away from genealogies and strife and quarrels about the Torah, for they are unprofitable and useless. Reject the device of man after the first and second warning. That's the person that's the problem. The problem is not this argument over genealogies and doctrine and Torah and this and that. The problem is the divisive person. Knowing that such a one has been perverted and sins being self-condemned. That's your problem right there. Let's go to Philemon real quickly. I think we can squeeze in the whole rest of this if, we're, if we hurry up. In Philemon, you have a greeting and an ending, both using the word favor. In verse 3, he says, Favor to you and peace from Elohim our Father and the Master Yeshua. Typical Paulian Shaul greeting. And then he finishes the letter with the favor of our Master Yeshua, Messiah be with you in your spirit. Amen. So that covers Philemon. Now we go to Hebrews. And we're going to wrap this up today, I think. Hebrews chapter 2 and in verse 9. But we do see him who was made for a little while uh, lower than the messengers, Yeshua, because of the suffering of death, crowned with esteem and respect, that by the favor of Elohim he should taste death for everyone, for it was fitting for him because of whom all are, and through him all are, in bringing many sons to esteem to make the princely leader of their deliverance perfect through sufferings. For both he who sits apart, who sets apart and those who are being set apart are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brothers." All right, so what's going on here? It says in verse 9, it says, look, he, Yeshua, that by the favor of Elohim, tasted death. In other words, none of this would have been going on unless the Father approved of it. It was by his approval. It wasn't by his unmerited favor. Let's see, let's plug that in there. Because of the suffering of death, crowned with esteem and respect, that by unmerited favor of Elohim, he should taste death for everyone. Does that make any sense whatsoever? But yet, that's what it says, if you read it according to the grace definition we all used to have. No, he, he, he says, because of the suffering of death, crowned with the steam and respect, that by the approval of being in good standing, being the, he's the one, the one above all others who's approved by Elohim, that he should taste death for everyone. That's why his death means so much. Amen. Let's go to chapter 4. And in verse 1. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering into his rest, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have come short of it. For indeed, the good news has brought to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not having been mixed with belief in those who heard it. Now let's keep that together. He says, the word which they heard didn't profit them because it wasn't mixed with belief. What is belief? In other words, they heard it, but they didn't take the actions that showed they believed it. For we who have believed, in other words, we have acted upon what we heard, do enter into that rest. And he has said, as I swore to my wrath, in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, and yet he works, excuse me, his works have come into being from the foundation of the world. For somewhere he has said thus about the seventh day, and Elohim rested on the seventh day from all his mighty works, I mean all his works. 
And in this again, if they shall enter into my rest. Since then, it remains for some to enter into it, and those who formerly received the good news did not enter in because of disobedience. Hmm? Pay attention. Since then, it remains for some to enter into it, and those who formerly received the good news did not enter in because of disobedience. He's talking about the good news that, by the way, was given to Israel when they came out of Egypt. The good news didn't just start after the death, burial, and resurrection of Mashiach. He said, but the reason they didn't get to enter in was because of disobedience. He then defines verse 7, a certain day, today, saying through David so much later, as it has been said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Yeshua had given them rest, excuse me, Yehoshua, this is Joshua, had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. So there remains a Sabbath keeping for the people of Elohim. So he's, this is going back to Moses now, then into Joshua. Joshua taking them into the land. He's saying if that was all it was about, then there would be no need for this. But they were disobedient. Verse 10, for the one having entered into his rest has himself also rested from his works as Elohim rested from his own. Let us therefore do our utmost to enter into the rest, lest anyone fall after the same example of disobedience. For the word of Elohim is living and working and sharper than any two-edged sword, cutting through even to the dividing of being and spirit and of joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and the inner intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all are naked and laid bare before his eyes, the eyes of him with whom is our account. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Yeshua, the son of Elohim, let us hold fast our confession... For we do not have a high priest unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, the one who, has, who is tried in all respects as we are apart from sin. Now, therefore, we get to verse 16. What does therefore mean? It means because of all that we just read, therefore. So we have to take into account everything we just read. And what did we just read? We just read, you've been offered the same thing others have been offered. Don't screw it up by being disobedient. And you'll be able to enter. That's what he said in a nutshell. Therefore, let us come boldly to the throne of favor or approval in order to receive compassion and find favor for timely help. Look at how this fits into everything that Tanakh said. You're going to come boldly before the throne of approval. So what do you say? When he says, if I've done anything to find approval in your eyes, then in order to receive mercy and compassion, because that's what you want. You say, Abba, I know I'm weak. I know I've messed up. Because what did verse 15 says? It says, look, we have a high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses. So now we're talking about a weaknesses moment. And you go boldly before the throne in that weakness moment. But you're someone who has sincerely been trying and making an effort. And you say, look, I'm coming before the throne of approval. If I've done anything that's brought approval, I would love to have some compassion and mercy right now. And then I can find approval for timely help. I'm going to find unmerited a merited favor for timely help? No, you're seeking him to approve, giving you timely help. Because you've done something previously that brought approval. And you're also seeking mercy and compassion, knowing that you don't deserve the approval. That's where the unmerited is. It's in the compassion part of that verse. It should be easy and obvious now that we've gone through 14 parts to understand what this is talking about. Let's continue in chapter 10. Let's continue in chapter 10. And verse 28. See, I had to read a whole chapter to, just to get to verse 16, that what it was all based on. But you can't read verse 16 and think that there's nothing happening when everything in chapter, in that chapter, chapter 4, was all about doing works and not doing disobedience. Doing actions based on belief. Chapter 10 and verse 28. Anyone who has, uh, who has disregarded the Torah of Moses dies without compassion on the witness of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think shall be, shall he deserve who has trampled the son of Elohim underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was set apart as common, and insulted the spirit of favor? Okay, let's read that verse and understand it. First of all, he says, anyone who has disregarded the Torah of Moses dies without mercy on the witness of two or three witnesses. Now we're talking about mercy there, compassion. Now we get to verse 28. It says, How much worse punishment do you think shall he deserve who has trampled the son of Elohim, underfoot counted the blood of the covenant by which he was set apart as common, and insulted the spirit of unmerited favor? How do you insult the spirit of unmerited favor? I think I could figure out how you can insult the spirit of approval. 
of merited favor, showing that if you're going to just trample this thing, how do you trample the stuff underfoot? By saying, I don't care what they say. I'm going to be fine anyway. What they say doesn't matter. What they did doesn't matter. What the son did, that's no big deal. I'm, I'm fine. I don't need all that. So you're going to insult the spirit of favor. In other words, when you show and demonstrate that you don't need approval, you're insulting the spirit of approval. Is that simple enough? When you act like you don't need approval, you are insulting the spirit of approval. How do you insult the spirit of unmerited favor? By doing more things that don't merit favor? You should be right in there really great. Let me do lots of things that don't merit favor. That should be right in line with the spirit of unmerited favor. That doesn't make any sense at all. It's ludicrous. Let's go to chapter 12. We're going to finish this today. All right, let's go to chapter 12, verse 28. Chapter 12 and verse 28. Therefore, receiving an unshakable reign, let us hold the favor through which we serve Elohim pleasingly with reverence and offer. Indeed, our Elohim is a consuming fire. All right. Let's go ahead and plug in the words. Therefore, receiving an unshakable kingdom or reign, let us hold the unmerited favor through which we serve Elohim pleasingly with reverence and awe. Well, I mean, it's laughable. But we all did this. You know why? Because grace doesn't automatically pop up all the time as unmerited favor unless someone asks you what grace means. Grace just sounds like this wonderful sort of word that's comes to that, that, that's what Elohim does with us. He does grace. This is what it's all about, grace. But you plug in the words, it doesn't make any sense. Let us hold the unmerited favor through which we serve Elohim pleasingly. Let's switch it around. Let us hold the approval through which we serve Elohim pleasingly. With reverence and awe, for indeed our Elohim is a consuming fire. I think all we have to do is plug in the two choices, and you can see very clearly which is the right choice. Chapter 13 and verse 9. Chapter 13 and verse 9. We have only two more references, both in chapter 13, as we finish the book of Hebrews, and then we'll wrap up. Chapter 13 and verse 9. Do not be borne about by various and strange teachings, for it is good for the hearts to be established by approval, by favor, not with foods which, were not prof which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. All right, so let's go through this real quickly. He says, do not be borne about by various and strange teachings. Various and strange teachings. Do we see a lot of that going on today? Amen. This, is, this, is the, the, this is a verse people need to hear over and over again. Do not be borne, I might just post that on my Facebook page over and over again. Do not be borne about by various and strange teachings. Of course, they're going to claim that I'm the one doing the strange teachings. <laughs> for it is good for the heart to be established by unmerited favor, not with foods. Again, does it make sense for it's good for the heart to be established with unmerited favor? It is good. So, don't, so just do whatever you want. Don't merit anything. No, it is good for the heart to be established by approval, not with foods which were not, have not profited. We're not going to get into the whole food things. Although food also could be teachings. What you're eating, you're eating of these various teachings. Let's go now to verse um, 24. We're going to wrap up Paul's letter here in the book of Hebrews. Okay, and as we get to the end of Hebrews, we're going to see, it says, uh, greet, greet all those leading you and all set-apart ones, those from Italy greet you. Favor be with you, with all of you. Amen. Amen. So, and of course, we don't know for sure that Shul wrote this, who wrote this, but the book of Hebrews, whoever wrote it, is going to finish with a typical ending that Shul liked to use, which is, favor be with all of you. Amen. Amen. And I wish that prayer on all of you, that favor or approval be with all of you. And I hope that we can all, now that we've finished this teaching series on the search for the doctrine of grace, understand that it's not a doctrine, it's simply to be found in approval or in good standing with the Almighty. It's what it's all about. It's all about Him looking down at you and saying, yes, this is my son, this is my daughter in whom I approve, who has my approval. They've earned, they've merited my approval by doing what I've asked them to do and not doing what I've asked them not to do. Otherwise, there's no point in doing and not doing anything. And that's the, that's the big problem you have in the mainstream of Christianity is the idea that it's unmerited and, it's, and it's, it just turns into complete lawlessness. Now, they will all agree you shouldn't murder and commit adultery, blah, 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 blah. 
But those are just arbitrary choices instead of saying we need to obey all that which Abba has said. We need to say, as Joshua said, as for me in my house, I'm going to serve the Almighty. I'm going to serve Yahweh. And how do you serve Yahweh? Well, you do everything he said and you don't do everything he said not to do. Now, we've looked at the 225 places this verse appears in the Tanakh. Hopefully, we have now a sound and thorough case being made for what grace really is and what it isn't. And I think this is a very, very important teaching, and I want to encourage you to share it with everybody you can. It's free. We don't charge for it. Give it away as best you can, because people need to understand that it is about grace, but not the way they always thought. Amen. We do want to be under grace. We want to be under the approval of the Almighty. And there's a path to that, and that path is called the fullness of Yeshua. Yeshua as Messiah, Yeshua as the Word, Yeshua as the Torah, Yeshua as the light, Yeshua as the truth. That brings approval. The more that we embrace that, transform and conform into that, will bring abundant approval upon approval upon approval. Amen? Amen, let's pray. Avinu Malkinu, our Father, King, Father, we come to you seeking your approval. Father, we acknowledge who you are. We want to come boldly before you, as instructed in the word here, to say we know that we are weak, we need compassion and mercy, we know that we fall short on a regular basis, but we also know that we do some things that you approve of. And Father, we ask that if we've done anything that brings approval in your eyes, that you would show us mercy and compassion to help us to become even more in approval by showing us the path to fixing those things that we still fall short in. Father, it's your approval that we desire. So, Father, help us to truly desire to look into the mirror of the Word, the mirror that is the truth, the Torah, Yeshua, as we desire to become the type of people you would want to live with forever, that we would want to seek after all those things that bring approval and merit, the worthiness of the kingdom, and that, Father, we would understand that salvation, while given freely, only opened up, and opened up the opportunity to merit approval in our actions. Because without salvation, all the merited action would still avail nothing. Without the salvation, we could do everything right and we would still not merit anything. Because once we did anything wrong once, it would be over. But because of salvation being made possible, we can have the opportunity to make teshuvah, to turn around, to be approved, to be reconciled, to be restored to favor. See, we have a lot of verses talking about being restored to favor, to be restored to grace. Well, how is that? You restored to unmerited favor? Well, if you're already in unmerited favor, why do you need to be restored to unmerited favor? We want to be restored to favor, approval, to be in good standing in your eyes. Father, help us to have a heart like David's, a heart to want to be approved in your sight. So, Father, we come to you and beg these things and, and ask these things very humbly. In the name of Yeshua, we ask, in his authority, our high priest who has experienced all the things as we have read and understands our sufferings and our shortcomings, but did not sin Father, we would like to also suffer with all our shortcomings and not sin as well. Help us to become that. Help us to become like Yeshua. And we ask in his name, in Yeshua's name, these things by his authority, as you've instructed us to do. And we say, Amen, the Amen.